So this vlog is starting in a funny way. I usually start before I get on the plane, but there was no time. Crazy story, running through airport, sweating, holding my pants up because my belt came off after security. Nuts. Rabbi Chaim Danziger, say hello. And we are on a plane from Moscow to Rostov, where he lives. He's a rabbi in the city of Rostov. He's the, the rabbi in the city of Rostov. It's a miracle we're on this flight because he arrived to the airport, I think, three minutes before check in closes. And he had to go through security and he had to go to in Moscow. I went out of the terminal, I was already in, schlepped his bags, went, ran, pushed it through. Somehow, the last thing they did us a favor, so it's a miracle we made this flight today. I usually don't travel, so it happens sometimes, but I try to be, uh, there was a problem with the taxi this morning. I ordered the, like, it's like an Uber, the Yandex, and then they sent someone for like a minute away and then they the canceled overslept, the driver. The overslept, the overslept. I did not overslept. Yeah, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> We're gonna be having a very interesting few days together and I'm excited to take you guys along on this journey. Let's go, let's go. Welcome to Rostov on Don, on the Don River. We just arrived in our beautiful city. We have about a 50 minute drive actually to the city center. And uh, beautiful day here. It's southern Russia. This is like the Miami of Russia, just a little nicer. <laughs> so, Rabbi Danziger. Chaim, Chaim. It's called it's, it's Chaim for now. Okay, so Rabbi Chaim Danziger. Chaim has been uh, on my case for, what is it, a year and a half, two years? Yeah, two years. Been asking me to come. Kept inviting me again and again and again. And then uh, it was right before COVID, where like I was seriously considering it. And then the Russian uh, government stopped giving visas. And this whole thing went on pause for a year and a half. But you know what? He's persistent and now we're here. And, uh, you know, he was supposed to come from Israel. So now he came from where? From New York, through Uman. Through Morocco. Through, Prague, through Morocco, through Prague, through Moscow. And um, and it's a big, big pleasure having you, Shlaimi. Thank you. Um, you know, you spread a lot of warmth, a lot of good Jewish vibes. And uh, it's time Southern Russia gets a little taste of that. And this is the center of Rostov we're driving into. And uh, this is uh, the place that was that was traditionally Jewish. So right over this bridge to the left side, you see this building with a clock. That whole area, our shul is actually just behind here. We'll go under the bridge. And uh, this whole area used to have, it used to be the Jewish quarter. I mean, you had uh, 13, 14 shuls here. You had uh, haters, you had schools. Okay, so uh, we just uh, went under the bridge and we're going up here on the street. It's called Gazetny Lane. And this is the street that has our beautiful synagogue. A synagogue that this year is celebrating 150 years. It was built in 1872. So we're going by the Jewish year, 150 years. We just had Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And um, it was built by brave Jewish soldiers. They're called Cantonist soldiers. And uh, right up here, you can take a look on the right. You see the uh, dome at the window, maybe it'll be uh, yeah. Okay, so we're going now into our beautiful 150-year-old shul. Synagogue. Oh, Amy. Thank you. You know what's the first thing you do when you come to a synagogue? What's the first thing you do? Kiss the mezuzah. Yes. The second thing you do is you grab a bite of kosher food because we've been traveling since what time? I left this morning at about 2 a.m. from Siberia to come here. We met on a flight. And neither of us had a breakfast. So we dive in, we prayed. Now we're gonna go have a bite. And then I'll show you our beautiful sanctuary, synagogue, and everything else we have. Drastic! Yeah. Shalom. 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 She works in our kosher store. We found her four generations of Jews that had nothing to do with the community or the synagogue or with anything Jewish. She lives not far from here one day. I walked past her and she said, Shalom, I said, are you Jewish? She said, yes. 
Turns out she has a daughter. That daughter has three children. And she, has a, she had a mother who since passed away. And in one great holiday, Rosh Hashanah, a few years back, they all came for the first time to services, to our synagogue. They got introduced back to their uh, heritage. And today she works here in our shul, in the kosher store, and she loves it. She reads all the books. When people come in, they wonder what Jewish book to buy. They ask her, she read them all. She has good advice. And this is all because one time you passed her on the street. And she said shalom. And she said shalom. That's right. Someone tells you shalom. Right away you answer shalom. Invite them for a little bit of kosher food home. And then, uh, and then you're in business. Delete the good things. Yeah. Standing outside this apartment building, and apparently the rabbi is going to be delivering some things. What's going on right now? So we go. Uh, we have a bunch of people. So we come to their homes. They don't leave their houses. Several years ago, we visited his house. Uh, it was Hanukkah, and I was told he wasn't feeling well. We came to his house with food, and we wanted to support him. He had no children, no family, and he said, "I don't need the food. I don't think I'm going to live too much longer. I don't want to live." And I heard someone say, "I don't want to live." I said, "Why? What happened?" He said, I had two heart attacks. I have, uh, you know, Yenamakla cancer, and, uh, and, and my wife died. I'm not to live for her. So I'm thinking with my kids, imagine, what do you tell someone who says he has nothing to live for? What do you tell him? I was thinking, I told him, Hirsch, we need you. He said, why do you need me? I said, we need you, and I'm thinking, what do we need him for? If someone's not needed, he doesn't feel like he needs to live. So I told him, we need you for the minion. He says, what do you mean? I told him that every day we have to say Kaddish, memorial prayers, for all the Jewish people from Rostov who were killed by the Nazis in 1942. And we only have nine people, I told him. You're the tenth man, we need you. Without you, we can't pray. He said, really? I said, yes. So he said, I'll come. And the next day he came with a cane, barely made it. The next day he came, and the next day, every day he comes. He kvetches, it's hard, it's this. But that's what kept him alive. And uh, thank God he's not a mathematician, because otherwise we would have noticed he wasn't a tenth man. But people need a reason to live. And Hirsch is a very holy person, a very holy Jew, special man. And uh, I'm coming to him. So we're going to visit him now? Yeah, we're going to visit him. So we have an online program to help these people that feel lonely. We come, we bring iPads, and we connect them with each other. So on the last one, just before Rosh Hashanah, he told me, Rabbi, I'd love to put a mezuzah on my house. I told him, it's never too late, Hirsch. Even if you're almost 90 years old, we can do this. I have a mezuzah here. We're going to fix the mezuzah and bring it to weekly food. And I'm sure he's going to be happy. Yeah, Hirsch. Shalom. Дорогой, так рад тебя видеть. Я тоже рад. От всей души. Это ты! Не забывайте, не thank you from all my heart. They don't forget about me. Как забыть вас, дорогой? Мы тебя любим. Ты же знаешь, ты же знаешь. Мезузу на выходе повесим, да? Мезузу. Когда будем выходить? По, скучайте по синагоге. Конечно. Тянет прямо, не могу. You can see he's like really passionate. He перенес коронавирус. Три месяца в больнице. He had corona for three months. He was in the hospital. And people were dying all around them. Девяносто процентов полмирали. Моложе меня были. Пупу, я постучу. Герш, я тебе сказал, что ты сильный. Ты нужен сто. Я сказал, что ты нужен, правильно? Конечно. I told him that he's needed. So Shams not taking him anywhere. 120 лет. Если что, 119. Хорошо? I told him 120 years. 119 at least. Yeah. Правильно? Конечно. Какая песня тебе нравится? Какая песня ты пел в синагогу? Ну, не вредно. Какая? Какая? Есть какая-то? What song am I asking you like? Хава Нагила. Хава Нагила. Хава Нагила. Хава Нагила. Венисмеха. Хава Нагила. Хава Нагила. Хава Нагила. Венисмеха. Можно ли танцевать? Ай, ла, 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 how old is this man? He's 88. 
88, and he's about to get his first mezuzah. And it's eight, never eight. too late, guys. Okay, this is good. Dak, Daragoy. Dak, me zelaim sichot mezuzah. For those yes. for those of you who are not familiar, a mezuzah is sort of like a spiritual security system, and he's about to get one on his door. Baruch, Baruch. Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam Asher Kedeshanu Demitzotav Vetzivanu Likvoa Mezuzah. Вот сюда, сюда, со мной вместе, повесим, вот так, опа, и поцелуем, поцелуем. О, мазалто! Мазалто! All day today, Rabbi, you've been taking me around. We're doing uh, kindness for people. Right. And uh, in Judaism, we have a concept called Chesed Shalemus. It's a kindness that cannot be repaid because as long as someone's alive, they can repay your kindness. When someone's gone, then uh, your kindness you do for them is eternal because they can't pay you back. So this is the uh, memorial for 27,000 Jews who were killed by the Nazis in 1942. The Nazis occupied Rostov twice. The first time, the occupation was only for a few days. They were uh, defeated and they left. The second time, they occupied already for half a year. And uh, they occupied at the end of July of 1942. You can see right here, this is this whole area. Um, and two weeks later, they put up signs all over town that all the Jews must gather at five different gathering points. And the reason they did this, they said, we're going to evacuate you to safety. It was a concept that when the war comes, you get evacuated. The Jews were naive and they thought that, uh, you know, the Nazis, the Germans, and educated people couldn't do anything bad. The Jews believed what they heard. They believed the German people and educated people. If they said they wanted to evacuate them, they wanted to. And they showed up to these places. They were told to bring their keys to their apartments and their valuables. And they came and the Nazis weren't expecting that many Jews. So they didn't even have enough trucks to bring all the Jews to this place, the outskirts. It was in the outskirts of town. They actually marched the Jews in the heat of August, which is, you know, 100 degrees, all the way here for many kilometers. It was mostly women, old men, and children, because the men were out on the front fighting to defeat the Nazi war machine. And it is here that they were brought. They gave up their belongings, and it is exactly at this place and they return their souls to the Creator. So this is the place where we say Kedoshim, holy people are buried right here. And we come here many times every year, and especially we come here on days that are connected to the tragedy, like the 11th and 12th of August. We did a big march of the living. Rabbi Lau from Israel joined us all the way from where one of the gathering points the year. And, uh, and we come here, and what do we do? We pray. Uh, some people have a moment of silence, but we make an emphasis, like the Lubavitcher Rebbe taught us, that what's most important is not being silent, but is actually actions and deeds, good deeds. And when we come and we re-embrace Judaism in a city which was occupied by the Nazis, which Hitler thought he freed of the Jews, when we come and we come to synagogue, we keep Jewish traditions and holidays, that is the biggest defeat of Hitler. And that's what we come here for, to tell the truth continuing the life that they led here and that Judaism will thrive and that we're, re we're going to rebuild what was once here before the Nazis came to Rostov. Rostov was a city with a huge Jewish population, it was a city with so many Jewish institutions. And thankfully, slowly but surely, we're returning, we're bringing that back to the city. So this is the eternal flame that burns here, it commemorates the lives of 27,000 men, women, and children were killed here on this very spot. They were killed just because they were Jewish. No other reason. You know, when I moved here 13 years ago, I remember my, uh, my wife's parents, my in-laws, asked me, why are we moving? And I said, we're coming here to inspire the local Jews. Now, 13 years later, I could say, we didn't come here to inspire the Jews. The local Jews are inspiring us. Wow. We just now left Hersh's home, left other people's homes. When we see the tremendous self-sacrifice they have 
and the way they live and what they do and uh, what they're willing to give up to embrace their Jewish roots. It gives me personally, as a uh, Jew who was born to an observant family, tremendous kochos, tremendous strength to kind of put things in perspective. You know, we all have some hardships, some challenges in life. When we see what these people are capable of, we realize that we could do much more. And if the challenges we have are really nothing. Good morning. It's a little bit after 8 a.m. I'm here in Rostov, Russia. So, uh, it's my second day here. And I'm on the way to synagogue for the morning prayers. The weather is so perfect. Thank you, Ashan. We've come to one of the most amazing places in our city. This building you're looking at here, it's uh, the building that 110 years ago or 105 years ago served as the center of Jewish life. In this building, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, came from Lubavitch to Rostov when the First World War broke out. And here, this was the house they bought. And this is where the Rebbe lived. This is where his followers came. And uh, you can look at a beautiful historic building, almost 200 years old. And I want to give you a little tour because there's some very interesting things in this building. Spasiba. The war broke out. Lubavitch, central, um, white Russia. The war was coming. The Rebbe had to evacuate somewhere. There were different options that came up. Eventually, he came to Rostov. It was 1915. He lived in an apartment building. He thought it would be temporary. So he put all of his books, the Sforum, all of his library in a temporary storage, thinking it's only temporary and eventually we're going to come back uh, to Lubavitch. Obviously, that wasn't the case because the war obviously lasted a lot longer and uh, the Rebbe settled here. So they bought this house. And right, I'm going to show you now. This mikvah is the mikvah that was used by the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, and the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe. And it's the original mikvah, the same tile. Have a look. This mikvah is the first mikvah that is built in such a way where you have the rainwater on the bottom and on top is the regular water. The tiles, everything is the same. The only thing that was added is the heating. So this is the most amazing mikvah, historic mikvah. It's the first Bor Al-Gabe Bor mikvah. And uh, every mikvah in the world that's built in this such a way is based what, on this mikvah here, how it was done. Go back to, to the time, 1918. The revolution is taking place, and the Rebbe goes out on the porch. This is Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he stands here on the porch, and he's looking at the main street there. The main street called Sadovaya. And he sees the marching parades celebrating the revolution. And people are happy, they think change is coming, and the Rebbe said, I can't live here with them. With the people that are against religion, I can't live in the same world with them. And shortly after that, the Rebbe passed away here. Seeing the parades, realizing there were the reds and the whites who were fighting against each other, said, no, I can't live in this world with them. So it's right this porch, this is the view, and also the neighborhood, look at some of the houses. Right? These are 200 year old buildings still standing here. And um, even in the late the 80s and 90s, the elder neighbors here, remember, there was the, they said there was a prophet, they're not Jewish, they said there was a prophet that used to live in this building, and, and we remember when we were children that our parents would say, well, there's a holy man there, come stop by. So uh, it's something that everyone knew, regardless of Jews, non-Jews. This is really cool because the Chabad Lubavitch movement has grown to thousands of different centers across the entire world in over a hundred different countries. And at one point, the entire movement was headquartered right here for like eight years. So that's a, that's a pretty big deal. You know what? It also shows you how things that can be can start small and grow really big, which is inspirational. So there is a custom in the Chabad sect of Hasidic Judaism that when a couple gets engaged, they go to the grave of one of the rabbis, one of the rabbis, to make it official. So at the moment, which is beautiful, so right now there's a couple who's coming and they're going to be getting engaged right here, right now, in the cemetery. Think about this for a second. A cemetery is a place where dead people are laid to rest. And there's usually not a happy occasion happening in a cemetery. But I think this custom is so beautiful because in a cemetery, in a place of death, you have 
people getting engaged, which symbolizes new life. And that's that's just a really nice inspirational thing. Say hello, everybody. So, so. What's happening today? We have uh, Vort. Vort, Vort. <laughs> Engagement. They're coming. So this is Aaron from Rostov. He is a dear, dear friend and a community member for many years. Kaya, you speak English? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maliki, Maliki. Okay. <laughs> She's from a city about eight hours away, Stavropol. And today they decided to get engaged. We're going to do a wedding. But what do you do? Engagement, setting up a Jewish home is something that requires a lot of blessings. You want to make sure that in the home there'll be, there'll be kindness, there'll be love, there'll be understanding between husband and wife, respect. So what do we do? That they should have a good family and they should have children. We come to the gravesite of a holy person, a righteous person, what we call a tzaddik. And we pray to God here, and we also ask that Tzaddik to pray for us, intervene, that in the mercy, that God should have mercy on, on us and on their family, and should bless them in the merit of the very holy Tzaddik that lived here. So this is the resting place, the grave of the fifth Lubavitcher Rabbi, the Rabbi Rashab. These are all the notes that people throw in with the requests for the Rabbi to pray for them in his eternal rest. Mazal tov, mazal tov. Uh, We just left the oil, they prayed, they asked that God should grant them peace in their home, all the blessings, spiritual, material blessings, they should have healthy children, children who follow in the paths of their ancestors, and we're very joyous. Yes, we are happy, or not? Yes, yes, yes. And they're officially engaged, that's it, they are officially engaged. Hey everybody, so thrilled, but I gotta tell you, there's so much more going on. You need to download that Meaningful Minute app right away, ASAP. You gotta do this, Schnell. There's an entire world in that Meaningful Minute app that's gonna bring you closer to the Abishta. So please, right now, get that app, download it, and really enjoy becoming so much closer to Hashem. So, I'm standing here on the street outside the synagogue in Rostov. This is the synagogue that we prayed in this morning and yesterday. And the rabbi is going to explain to me the special significance of this synagogue. Okay, so uh, this synagogue was one of 14 synagogues that existed in Rostov. And it, but it's the last remaining synagogue today. It was built by Cantonists. Who knows what a Cantonist is? I'll tell you. Come. Cantonists were brave Jewish soldiers who at age eight or nine, they were plucked, they were taken from their parents' homes against their parents' wishes to a 25-year mandatory service in the Tsar's army here in Russia. Now, these kids were taken. They'd come to their village, the Jewish village. They'd tell you, you need to give up 20 kids tomorrow. The parents would have a meeting at the rabbi's house and they'd decide which kids would be given up. And those kids would never see their parents again. They'd leave at age, let's say, nine, 10. They'd be uh, taken thousands of miles away to be re-educated in a secular system. And at age 18, they'd begin a 25-year uh, service in the Tsar's army. So they'd fr get out of army at age 43. When they got out of the army, they came to Rostov. They, they, there were many synagogues. There's a much bigger synagogue. But they didn't feel at home. They didn't feel welcome. They said, you know what? We have to have our own synagogue. And this is the beautiful synagogue they built. And this is the synagogue that we have, that we're privileged to pray in and to, uh, uh, to, to house to this very day. This is our community center. This is our Russia call right here. Okay. okay, so we come in here. And uh, to give you an idea, these people were so brave. These uh, soldiers, when they came back, they knew very little about their heritage, their traditions, but they knew we're proud Jews. We must have our synagogue. And to this day, outside, I'll show you, it says Taldatskaya Synagogue, the soldier school. Take a look. How beautiful is this synagogue? Look at the beautiful ceiling. Look at the arc. Lights from behind. And uh, what's so interesting is, that Rostov had the main synagogue, the Koral Synagogue. And that was around the corner, like three times this size. And in another synagogue up the block. And somehow it so happened that all these synagogues are no longer in existence. Some of them were bombed by the Nazis, others were confiscated. This is the one synagogue that remains, and it's a synagogue that was built by who? 
by simple Jews, Cantonese soldiers. They weren't simple, but ones who knew so little. What's the message? I think the message is that you don't need to be a holy person, an amazing, famous person to do something meaningful. Look at these simple Jews. They built this beautiful, beautiful synagogue. And today, not only do people come here to pray, not only do people come here to meet other Jews and to get kosher food, today it's a center of chesed, of kindness. Because since COVID hit, this is the center of here. We have a, a huge um, uh, kindness store. People come here to get food on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. You have a, a meat pantry. They come, they get meat every meat month so they can have kosher food. So this, suddenly this synagogue became a place where not only worship of kindness, a place where people come together to support one another. And uh, yeah, this is the synagogue. Beautiful. So recently we did some renovations in the synagogue. So we decided to go up to the attic. And what did we find in the attic? We had to clean up some stuff. There was no golem. So that's a story for Prague, which is a separate story. We found there these calendars. So Jewish calendar, it's so important to have a Jewish calendar because according to the Jewish calendar, you know when the Jewish holidays are, new months, everything goes according to the Jewish calendar. Calendar. So we found all these calendars that were handwritten. Today, a Jewish calendar, you get it. Here, take a look. Today's Jewish calendar you get from the Jewish community, different companies, organizations, produce calendars. Look at this. This is a calendar from 1950. So right after the Nazis left town, five years after the Nazis were defeated, and it's all handwritten. So you had people here in the Jewish community that were worried after the Nazis occupied the city. They killed all the Jews. Some Jews came back to the city. They were worried when are the holidays. They had hand wrote these calendars, which is unbelievable, to know and to calculate the dates, the holidays, the new months, which uh, Torah portions are being read on which week. Um, it's just unbelievable. I see this, and they have for each year, we found one of these, and it was done by hand, and it has all the details of, of when the new month begins, when the moon is, um, uh, you know, unbelievable. So this is something that was very, just touching this, done by hand, this is not easy to do. So when we just came out with our new calendar for the community, we're thinking, wow, what an amazing, amazing, we're making a calendar today. It's designed, it's easy. You're copying the data from online. And this is how they did it back in the day. Why? So that today we could have the freedoms we have, so that today we could remember what it means to be a Jew. They wanted to keep it. And we're in debt to our elders here, I mean, the elders of the community who kept the life here, the traditions alive. So here, they are from all the years, 54, 55, 56, 57, 52, 53, all handwritten. We have a real big celebration today. We're making a lachaim for a wonderful couple that today decided that they'll have a Jewish wedding, a chuppah, establish a Jewish home. Today we go to Bakal. First, Bakal is something that we need to do. Bakal is not beer. I think we need to do beer. We need to do beer. А что у тебя? У тебя есть лехайм? Ну, а на что надо? Водка, наверное, если... Лехай, лехайм. За Арон, на, Арон. За Арон и за Хая, которые сегодня... Я их сопровождал на могилу Ребе, где они попросили благословения и помолились. They went to the oil today, Давин. They requested a blessing and they prayed to God that they should establish a good, good, good home. And that they should have only revealed blessings. Lechaim, 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 lechaim. Siman tov, mazal tov, mazal tov, siman tov, siman tov, mazal tov, mazal tov, siman tov, siman tov, mazal tov, mazal tov, siman tov. Yehelano, yavid belech Yisrael, kai mekaya. There is a song called Nigun Rastav. It's the song of Rastav, which comes from originally from Chabad Labavitch. And now we're going to sing it right here live in Rastav. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah
Rumor has it that the plug is ready. Let's take a look. Round Chef, two. This is let's round see. two. Let's see. One, two, three. Whoa. That looks delicious. Time to go to the airport. Thank God it was such a beautiful trip. Such amazing people here in Rostov. And I feel like even once I leave, part of my heart is always going to be here. So if I want to be complete with my heart, I'm going to have to come back. First of all, I want to say, we just finished this engagement party. Right. It's past midnight. These two guys are supposed to go home. It's already 1 a.m. They're supposed to go home to sleep. They said it was taking Shalimi to the airport. I said I'd like to, but I had a little time. I'm not allowed to. They said, you know what, we'll take him. It's an hour away there. It's an hour back. Tomorrow's Yom Kippur. They met him today, a few hours ago. That's true. They said, we're not. We're not going to let him take a taxi. We need to take him. So they came back. They're taking him to the, to the airport. Wow. So that says from the Shalom, you should leave the, way, uh, the same way you came. Um, but, you know, you've been here for 36 hours. It feels like five days. In, Ru <laughs> in Russia, before you go, you officially have a little bit of a high end. So here, I saw, I saw a bottle on a car. This water, I like, yeah. I was like, I'm very impressed to have a bottle to say goodbye <laughs> a little high end. But it was amazing meeting you. The, right, thank you so much for, for having uh, me. This is this, this was a special trip. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't usually say this. This was, uh, I told you tonight, you got upgraded to uncle status. Uncle status to my children is like, there's, there's like three, four people that have that. Wow. And I know a wow. lot of people. Thank you so and much. I hope that this isn't the last journey to Rostov. No, this is the first of many. Oh. Uh, 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 inshallah. No? Inshallah, inshallah. For centuries, the Jews of Russia suffered. They suffered under the Tsar, they suffered under the Nazis, and they suffered under communism. Thankfully, in the past 30 years, the Jews of Russia have been able to practice Judaism openly and freely. But even in the toughest of times, the Jews of Russia have always proven that they will fight to preserve their heritage and their religion no matter what, because the Jews and the Torah will always endure.